Tonight, devastating collapse. A cargo ship takes out a massive bridge in Baltimore. Yo! What the Investigating the collision. Sound like a gunshot. It was loud. And a look at safety precautions in Canada. That's an alarming number of animal deaths in just four years. Seeking answers after two more whales die at Marineland. I never had a situation like, like this before. Plus, big league gambling scandals and the role of legalized betting. This is a, a very exciting moment for Canada. Also, a Canadian medical first. New research on treating potentially deadly superbugs. Plus, when rich chocolate refers to the price. And it was six bucks, and it's minuscule. The bitter taste of soaring cocoa costs ahead of Easter weekend. CTV National News with Omar Sachadina. Good evening, everyone. Six construction workers are presumed dead tonight in the frigid waters of the Patapsco River in Baltimore after the catastrophic collapse of a bridge 30,000 vehicles cross every single day. The scale of the fatal disaster clearly visible in daylight today. Video from overnight shows the last two cars on the bridge seconds before it came crashing down. A critical mayday call the ship sent before the collision allowed authorities to stop traffic. It took just four minutes from the first signs of trouble to the moment the ship crashed. At 1.24 a.m., the light suddenly went out on the ship's deck, then came back a minute later. Smoke now billowing from the stack. Then at 1.26 a.m., the vessel, the Dolly, appeared to turn, and at the same moment, the lights went out again. Two minutes later, the ship collided with the bridge, sending it crumbling into the river below. It does not appear the bridge had protective barriers, now a key part of the investigation. CTV's Adrian Gobriel is on the ground in Baltimore and leads us off tonight. A catastrophic collapse. The bridge is gone. Holy The surreal scene playing out in the early morning hours as Baltimore's Francis Scott Key Bridge went from standing tall to in a matter of seconds vanishing into the Patapsco River. The frantic moments captured in this emergency dispatch call. 313 dispatch, the whole bridge just fell down. Start, start, whoever, everybody, the whole bridge just collapsed. The 300 meter long vessel issued a mayday call moments after leaving the port in Baltimore, warning it had lost propulsion and power. Here its lights can be seen blinking as smoke billows from the ship as it careens into a center support column, buckling the 2.6 kilometer bridge. Tonight, a painful update as first responders announced that search and rescue efforts have ended. Based on the length of time that we've gone in the search, the extensive search efforts that we've put into it, the water temperature that at this point we do not believe that we're going to find any of these individuals still alive. At the time of impact, a crew of road workers filling potholes were on the bridge. Eight people are believed to have gone down with the structure. Two were rescued. As of this evening, at least six others are presumed dead. Teams of divers had been sent into the frigid waters in a desperate search for survivors. These are individuals who, in the middle of the night, jumped into some very challenging environments, some very challenging territories. Our prayers are with everyone involved in this terrible accident and all the families, especially those waiting for the news of their loved one right now. The National Transportation Safety Board is leading the investigation that currently has far more questions than answers. The ship was traveling at approximately 15 kilometers an hour at the time of impact, a rapid speed, according to government officials. This is no ordinary bridge. This is one of the cathedrals of American infrastructure. It has been part of the skyline of this region for longer than many of us have been alive. The bridge named after the writer who penned the Star Spangled Banner opened in 1977. More than 12 million vehicles traversed the crossing in 2023. This is also an essential shipping corridor. More than $80 billion worth of cargo was transported out of Baltimore's port last year. And now the economic pipeline for this region has come to a sudden tragic halt. NTSB investigators say they'll be looking to access the ship's recorders. They want to determine whether or not the vessel dropped its anchor to try and slow down. As many wonder if anything could have been done 
to prevent this deadly disaster. Omar. All right, Adrian Gobriel in Baltimore tonight. The Francis Scott Key Bridge, as Adrian mentioned, was named after the man who wrote the U.S. national anthem, took five years to build and seconds to collapse. Here's how witnesses describe the moment. To actually see that the bridge has fallen is like, whoa, it's like mind blowing. It sounded like a gunshot. It was just loud. We just heard a loud bang. We got up and we were like, what the hell was that? The disaster has many Canadians focusing on key infrastructure here. Here's CTV's Quebec Bureau Chief Genevieve Beauchemin. Authorities managing bridges across this country sought to bolster the confidence of Canadians concerned about their commutes today. Among them, the St. Lawrence Seaway Management Corporation that handles spans from Montreal to Lake Ontario. It said it wanted to reassure the public and its stakeholders that bridge design and robust physical protections safeguard all structures along the marine corridor. Engineers say an accident here, like the collapse south of the border, is unlikely, though not impossible. Worldwide, at least 35 major bridges collapsed in the wake of ship or barge collisions from 1960 to 2015. Now, Canada's worst bridge collapses date back decades. In 1958, 19 people died in British Columbia after support on the second Narrows Bridge gave out. But it wasn't a collision. The bridge was under construction then. But of concern now that shipbuilders have made bigger and bigger cargo ships to carry more and more goods over the years. The Dali is far from the largest, but is 300 metres long. Canada's tallest building, first Canadian place in Toronto, is just a little taller than that. These ships were so large and just so massive, the amount of force uh, that that uh, ship could impart onto the, the bridge uh, substructure, you know, of course, could be enough to take it down. But officials say strict protocols are in place and that safety is the primary concern. Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Montreal. Saskatchewan police say there is no risk to the public after the bodies of two parents and their two adult children were found dead. Mounties made the grisly discovery at this farm near the village of Newdorf, about 140 kilometers northeast of Regina. They say the deaths are considered suspicious, but aren't releasing any further details. An investigation shrouded in mystery for four years became even murkier today. After revelations, two more whales died at Ontario's marine land. And as CTV's Heather Wright reports tonight, there are questions about its future. On this gray afternoon, marine land is quiet. The amusement park is still closed for the winter. No one around to answer questions about the recent deaths of two more beluga whales. <coughs> Ontario's Solicitor General, which oversees animal welfare services, says it was recently made aware that two belugas died earlier this month amid an ongoing investigation that began in 2020. 16 beluga whales and one killer whale have died at the park since 2019. And I'm angry because what's it going to take? Like, what, what does it take to shut this place down? Melissa Matlow is with World Animal Protection and is calling on the Ontario government to step in and do more to protect animals. Any other business that would face this level of concern and criticism would be shut down. What is it about animals that doesn't register the same level of response. A spokesman for the Solicitor General would not comment on the investigation into Marineland or why it is taking so long. Marineland says its whales are under weekly supervision and oversight by a government regulator and cared for daily by in-house vets. They say independent necropsies confirm the two recent whale deaths were caused by torsion, an abnormal twisting of the stomach. Adding staff made valiant medical efforts to assist them. The statement goes on to say the reality is that all animals eventually die from one cause or another, whether in the wild or captivity. Earlier this month, Marineland was found guilty of three charges under Ontario's animal cruelty laws related to its care of three black bears that lived in cramped enclosures with little access to water. It's not clear when or if Marineland will open for this season. There's still no ticket information on its website. Last year, opening day was May 20th, less than two months away. Heather Wright, CTV News, Niagara Falls, Ontario. New details tonight about what police discovered in their raids of residences belonging to rapper Sean Diddy Combs. Guns were seized at both of his homes in Los Angeles and Miami. 
The Homeland Security investigation is centered around alleged sex trafficking. Authorities say a known Diddy associate was also arrested. Brendan Paul is accused of being a mule for Combs's guns and drugs. Toronto police say they're not investigating a member of the Raptors who is reportedly the subject of an NBA probe into sports gambling. The issue has been under the microscope lately, and not only in basketball. CTV's Michael Couture on alleged match-fixing controversies and their impact on pro sports. Toronto Raptors backup center John Tay Porter is the central figure of an investigation involving betting irregularities, according to ESPN. Oh, and Olenek with the rebound. The NBA is reportedly looking at two games in particular. Ahead of tip-off, sportsbooks saw an unusual spike in bets on Porter underperforming for those games. And in both cases, Porter took himself out of the games due to injuries. As a coach of the team, I never uh, doubt uh, injuries. I never doubt, you know, honesty from players. Obviously, I never had a situation like, like this before. However, since sports betting became legal in Canada and the U.S., players have noticed a change in how fans criticize their performance on the court. People are always just like, you screwed up my parlay, you couldn't get three rebounds, you get whatever they say. Yeah, I mean, yeah, for sure, online a lot. Every play, every game. Gaming companies have become huge sponsors of pro sports leagues. In the NBA alone, there are partnerships with 17 separate gaming operators. I don't know necessarily that the NBA wants to get the genie back in the bottle. Uh, they get addicted to money very, very quickly, and this is a very lucrative source. A baseball isn't immune either. Superstar Shohei Otani's former interpreter is accused of gambling, but the Japanese slugger denies any involvement. Still, some believe there have to be better restrictions on gambling to prevent temptation for players. There are teams, the broadcasters, uh, the facilities are saying bet, 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 bet. That puts them in a very difficult situation. The NBA has yet to make any formal announcement about John T. Porter, but a league spokesperson has reportedly said they're looking into the matter. Omar. All right, Mike, thanks. A major economic red flag from the Bank of Canada today. It warned weak productivity has reached an emergency level, making it tougher to curb inflation. You know those signs that say, in an emergency, break the glass? Well, it's time to break the glass. The bank's second-in-command says productivity has been flat for seven years and that even though the Canadian workforce is educated and has access to foreign markets, weak competition and a lack of business investment in machinery and equipment have stifled economic output, causing Canada to lag behind its G7 peers. Left unaddressed, she says it may push interest rates higher and limit wage increases. The central bank said another culprit is failure to integrate immigrants into the workforce, including Ukrainians. Many of them have made Canada home. But as Ottawa prepares to cap the number of temporary residents to deal with a housing shortage, critics say the government also has to find a way to better support refugee claimants. CTV's Judy Trin takes a closer look. Delivering food to shelters is not the job Alex Moretsky trained to do. In Ukraine, he was a lawyer working in the energy sector. But that didn't translate into an equivalent job here. It's not most easy. Uh, it's uh, uh, especially another like society. It's uh, everything new was for us. Just over a year ago, Mokretsky fled Russia's invasion with his young family and mother-in-law. They're among the nearly 300,000 Ukrainians who have arrived in Canada with temporary work permits. Canadians should unabashedly be proud of this. At the same time, there should be an honest conversation about what the rise in international migration means for Canada as we plan ahead. But the influx of Ukrainians is adding pressure to Canada's welfare system. Struggling to make ends meet, they're ending up in shelters like the Mission in Ottawa, along with a record number of asylum seekers from Latin America and Africa. Suddenly, refugee and asylum seekers were showing up on our doors. People who had nowhere else to turn, people who had arrived by the airport to come into Canada. In January, the federal government announced $362 million to help house refugees. It takes months for asylum seekers to get temporary work permits, while processing their claims can take years. And ensuring a well-resourced system that can quickly and fairly process asylum claims is critical to managing 
volume of temporary residents. Mokretsky can work, but he needs two jobs and needs to work seven days a week to support his family. It's a hard road he's willing to take. We want to stay in Canada. Yeah, we, we want to, Canada will be our second home. Ukrainians who fled after Vladimir Putin declared war account for nearly 12 percent of the 2.5 million temporary residents who currently live in Canada. Omar. All right, Judy, thank you. Coming up, the high-stakes battle over the abortion pill in the U.S. lands at the Supreme Court. The major case that could restrict access. Plus, not so sweet. The soaring cost of chocolate. Arguments in America's highest court today on efforts to limit access to the abortion pill, the most common method of abortions in the United States. Here's CTV's Annie Bergeron Oliver. For the first time since Roe v. Wade was overturned in 2022, abortion access is back in the hands of U.S. Supreme Court justices. This is another example of what happens when democratic institutions like the Supreme Court are captured by people who have ideological positions that they want to push through. Today, the U.S. Supreme Court is hearing arguments about whether the U.S. Federal Drug Administration made the abortion pill, Mifa Prystone, more available without due diligence. The FDA's actions have made taking chemical abortion drugs less safe. The plaintiffs, a group of anti-abortion medical organizations, allege the FDA failed to adequately consider the dangers of mifepristone when it eased rules in 2016 and 2021. If we don't get it, shut it down. But the FDA says the medication is extremely safe. This is a completely baseless case that is uh, founded on, on shoddy science and misinformation. Mifa Prystone is available in 60 countries and is considered the gold standard for medical abortions up to 9 or 10 weeks. In Canada, experts say the pill now accounts for nearly 40 percent of abortions, including miscarriage care. The ability to have a health care provider prescribe medication abortion, potentially even through telemedicine over the phone, and then only have to do one visit to a pharmacy or a clinic and then be able to have your abortion at home is a huge game changer in terms of access. Since Roe v. Wade was overturned, 21 states have banned or restricted abortion access, and many fear this case could limit access even further. Some women could be forced to undergo more invasive surgical abortions. Others might not be able to access the drug at all. The Supreme Court heard arguments today, but a decision isn't expected until sometime this summer. Annie Bergeron Oliver, CTV News, Ottawa. Still ahead, the promising new Made in Canada medical solution. Canadian researchers are hoping to expand a small but intriguing test of a new kind of way of treating deadly superbug infections. It uses a class of virus called phages, first uncovered here in Canada more than a century ago. They can attack and kill bacterial infections, but fell out of sight when antibiotics were developed. CTV News medical correspondent Avis Favreau on the promising new signs. Every year, about 130,000 Canadians get a knee or hip replacement, most without a hitch. But some end up like Taya Turcott, with life-threatening bacterial infections in their new joints that defy treatment. It was very scary, very nerve-wracking. The 79-year-old endured 15 surgeries to remove infected tissues. Antibiotics all failed or caused toxic side effects as the infection ate away at her bones and pushed out through her skin, with doctors suggesting an amputation. The amputation would have been very high, almost up to my waist on the one side. So I would have had no, hardly any mobility whatsoever. Are you ready for your next dose? I am. But three weeks ago, Taya became the first in Canada to receive phage therapy for this treatment-resistant implant infection. Phages are found all over nature. They latch on to bacteria and kill them with few side effects. Her phages were supplied by this Winnipeg company that located a strain matching Taya's infection. 
billions were infused into her hip and more into her IV over two weeks. With each dose, uh, signs of inflammation in the body uh, interestingly went down. This is a, a very exciting moment for, uh, for Canada and for Canadian medical research. That's because studies from Europe and the U.S. using phages this way have suggested they can cure these now incurable infections with this first approved use of its kind in Canada. Health Canada has been criticized recently for uh, its slow pace in approving compassionate use cases for phage therapy. And seeing Health Canada moving in this direction is, is terrific. Taya, meanwhile, will be monitored to see how her infection resolves, with researchers prepared to treat at least four other patients like her at risk of losing their limbs to this treatment-resistant infection. Avis Favreau, CTV News, Toronto. A 10-year-old Ontario boy has capped off an incredible achievement with a spot in the Guinness Book of World Records. I feel like everybody loves this kid. Jace Weber, who is on the autism spectrum, wanted to raise money for people with disabilities. So he started collecting pop tabs. Soon, word spread, and he ended up with 6.2 million of them, earning him almost $2,600 for charity. Persistence pays off. After the break, the climbing cost of cocoa. Well, satisfying your sweet tooth could cost you more. The key ingredient in chocolate has catapulted to record highs. CTV Sarah Plowman on the cocoa cost crunch just ahead of Easter. Like the Easter bunny, chocolate prices have jumped. They're ridiculous. Well, what? Totally ridiculous. And biting into budgets. Those Easter eggs in a pouch? Well, those eggs are 30% more expensive this year compared to last year. Bad weather and a fungal disease is affecting cocoa trees in West Africa, causing a global shortage and sending prices skyrocketing. There were a couple of times there where we tried to order and they just didn't have any in stock. In Canada, this expert says chocolate is between 3 to 5% more expensive than it was in January. He predicts prices will keep climbing, companies may swap cocoa for other ingredients, and more shrinkflation is on the horizon. The Cadbury egg this year is smaller compared to last year uh, by a few grams. Chocolatiers say they can't cut corners. People, people can tell, right? They, when they come here, they can tell it's quality. Costs of shipping and ingredients forced her to hike prices in January. In six months time, I'm not sure what my prices will be. Still, shoppers are bringing chocolate bunnies home. I mean, you still have to do what you have to do and you have to buy what you need and sticking with tradition, but bittersweet about the cost to build that basket. Sarah Plowman, CTV News, Fredericton. And that's a snapshot of this Tuesday for all of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching. Good night and see you tomorrow.